Hello everyone, Lars here. Uh, it is time for the second review video for Unit 2. I don't know if you can see the mic. The mic is kind of close. Wow. Forget it. Who cares if you can? Forgive me if I seem a little shreddy, schwitzy. Um, I had a flat tire this morning on my Jeep and I had to get it towed to the local Pep Boys. I live in Metuchen. There's a Pep Boys over on Old Post Road in Edison. And it took me forever to get in touch with that towing service. If you do it through Pet Boys and you have a card, it only costs you 25 bucks. So it's worth it to, you know, wait and be inconvenienced. I was literally on hold for like an hour before they got to me. It was awful. It's some national service to just be some local one. Anyway, the Jeep is over there now. The Jeep is over at Pet Boys and I wasn't going to sit there for three hours like a bump on a log. So I rode my bike over there and the kid kid in the wrecker I said I'm gonna ride my bike I'll meet you over there and it's it's less than a mile away so it wasn't hard and then I got them I'm they're putting two new tires on the back and because my spare was messed up that's why I didn't just pop the spare on because I had a bad spare too because I'm lazy I probably the last time I blew a tire I just put the spare on um so now I'm getting tires over the Jeep but this is the story I'm gonna tell you this story hopefully it's gonna be fast because I don't want to bore you <clears throat> but I got I got a couple of cats neighborhood cats and there's a flap in my basement window and the a couple of the cats go in and I keep dry food down there and water and stuff. Little black one is named Nostromo. So about a week, week and a half ago, I'm driving home. It's late at night because it's the beginning of the semester and, and God forbid I get home before nine o'clock. And I'm driving down the street and all of a sudden something black darts in front of my Jeep and bugunk, bugunk. I drive over it and I'm like, oh my God. Christ, I just I just killed Nostromo. That's terrible. So I go to park my car to see what happened, and instantly I know I didn't hit Nostromo because the entire street stinks. I ran over a skunk, and I park my car, and the back of my car smells like skunk, and I look down the road, and I can see the poor skunk is, is not doing well, so I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Go in the house. I drop all my stuff off. I grab a flashlight. Basically, I'm just, you know, if the skunk is gone, I'm going to put on some rubber gloves and put it, you know, in a bag and take care of business. But the craziest thing happened. I turned the corner with the flashlight and I look and who's standing over the dead skunk but a little baby skunk. It was like Bambi. It was terrible. I just heard Bambi running through the woods yelling, mother, mother. It was, and it, the, the, I saw the little two eyes looking back at me. I'm like, oh my God, it never occurred to me. I just created a single parent home. That kid's not going to go to school. Or that kid's going to be smoking behind the 7-Eleven. It's just awful what I've done. So I'm just like, I'm not, going there. I'm not going down there to get attacked by a family of skunks. To hell with that. So I go back in the house. Come out the next day. Skunk is gone. So either one of my neighbors took care of it or the township did or something. <laughs> no, probably wasn't the township, believe me. <clears throat> so I figure that's the end of it, right? Two days later, come home, park the, park the Jeep in front of the house. Come in, make some food, do whatever I do, blah, blah, blah. Half hour later, I go outside, and I thought skunks were nocturnal. I thought they were like raccoons. I thought if you saw one during the day, watch out, they're probably rabid. Two skunks by my tire, like smelling it, like yeah, like saying, yeah, this is the one. This is the guy who, who killed Grandpa, or whoever it was I killed. And I've, I was like, get out of here, get out of here. And they don't, apparently they don't scare easy because they just stared at me. These nasty little skunk stares. And I'm not going near them because I'm not getting sprayed. I got sprayed once when I was a kid. I had to sit in a bathtub full of V8 for two hours to get the smell off me. So I'm thinking, oh, this is crazy. Night after that, I'm sitting here at my dining room table doing stuff and I can see the side of the house. I've got skunks circling the house. Okay? I'm being terrorized by a family of skunks. And now I have a flat tire? Coincidence? Or have the skunks up to their game? Somewhere there's a skunk with a little pocket knife, and that skunk now is is vandalizing my car. I'm sure of it. I'm certain of it. Here, hold on. Of course my glasses fall on the ground. And of course we spent the first five minutes and we haven't done a damn thing with Python. Let's see. Oh. Look. Flat tire. You can't tell me the skunks didn't do that. That was my tire last night, the skunk flat. So now I'm stranded here. Stranded is not the most descriptive word in the world because I got everything I want here. But I'm sitting at the house while Pep Boys is fixing my Jeep because of the skunks, because I'm being terrorized by a family of skunks. 
It's just, it's, I don't know what to do about it. I'm at my wit's end. But anyway, now that you know the story, now that you know why I'm off a of stir, <laughs> we can get going with the Python video. This is a good one, too, because after this one, we can finally solve problems. We can finally do work. We can probably do a bunch of stuff. The, uh, you know, if you read the slides, how we're going to be start, start looking at, at Project Euler stuff after this. But let's get started and look at some Haloops. Hold on a minute. We'll put that there. And we will put this here. And we will start with the easiest loop you could possibly have. First, I'm going to create a list. If you remember from the first half of these slides, that's an easy proposition. You just put something in brackets. And then to make sure we are good, I'm going to print my list. Watch while we're doing this video, the phone rings, and it's Pep Boy saying you're done. Save, print, and we just print that list, okay? A loop is a construct in programming where we want to set up a situation <coughs> where everything in a list or a sequence, remember the first half of these slides, we talked about sequences, strings, lists, later we're going to get to files, things that, you know, are sequential. Um... We want to create a construct where we do something or we regard every item in a sequence. So in programming, we usually use something called a for loop, and it's no different in Python. So I'm going to quick do one, then we're going to talk about it. I'm going to say for i, i is just a variable. could be integer, it could be iteration, hails from mathematics, but usually, classically, we use i for this variable. And I'll say for i in, and you see the four and the in are turned orange by idle because they're keywords. And I'll just say my list, okay? And then I'll say colon to create a block, just like we did with if then. And then all I'm going to do in this instance is I'm going to print it. So I'm going to print i every time through the loop. The value i takes the value of the item in the list. So the first time through, i will be two. The second time through, I will be four, then six, all the way until the end, and then Python says this is the end of the list, we're just going to end and it'll drop out. And to show what happens when it drops out, I'll just print and, and do that, okay? So if we run this little piece of code, you can see two, four, six, eight, I just run it to the end, okay? Now, I don't want you to think you're limited to only one thing. You're not. You can have a code block. Uh, let's do, uh, I think I usually do the squares. And then we'll print a little divider. And now when we run this, you can see I print the number. Then it's square, divider, number, square, divider. See? So we have a small little block of code that we do for every item in the list. So that, frankly, is the simplest loop you can have in Python. Now, people with experience in Java or C++ or C, this is a little bit different than what you've seen in the past, right? In the past, when you've done a for loop, you're like, okay, I gotta set the variable, then I gotta set a condition, then I've gotta do either my increment or my decrement, you've gotta set up this big construct. We don't do that in Python. Python only iterates over lists. It's up to you to create the list. So in this case, I have a list up there, I'm gonna go through all of the items. So if you wanted to do, and we're gonna do it in a second, if you wanted to do a classic for loop that counts from, say, one to 10, well, we're going to create a list that has the numbers from 1 to 10, and you're just going to iterate over that list. So Python's a little bit different. After a while, when you start thinking about it, this is the more natural way to do things as far as iteration is concerned. Just go over whatever list you have, whatever sequence you have, go over everything once. That's it. You don't have to construct this thing that's going to increment by one and check a condition every time and do this and do that like the other languages do. Just go through the list. That's all. Now, do you want that old functionality so you can go one through ten? Well, then we'll provide it, but we'll provide it by giving you a way to create a list that has the numbers one through ten. All right, let's mark this off and go take a look at that. Now, let's say I wanted to just do a for loop that printed the numbers we're computer scientists, we start counting at zero, say zero to nine. I can say four i in, and then I use, I'm gonna call it a function for now, but it's not, range, and I say range 10, and then I'm just gonna print i. 
Now, run this, and as you can see, I get 0 through 9, okay? Now, what you're looking at is kind of shorthand, because what I'm really printing is this. See? Same thing. Range takes an interval. So, like all intervals in Python, 0 is the first thing I want. 10 is the first thing I don't want. So 10 technically just gives me the amount of items, okay? But it's the first number that you don't get if you print them out, okay? And then one is what we would call the increment. So it increments by one, all right? Now, zero and one are seen as defaults if they're not listed. So if I just do 10, it'll give me zero through nine. It, takes, it assumes the zero and it assumes the one. Now, if I wanted to do something like a countdown or something like that, I could say I want to start at 1 and I want to go to 11, and I can do that. I could go 1 through 10, all right? Now, if I could also, if I wanted to, I could start at 10. I could go to 0 because 1 is the first thing I don't want, and I can say negative 1, and I can go backwards, and that will produce a countdown, 10, 9, 8, all the way to 1. Okay, so range is pretty powerful. Range, for our purposes with this looping, it's, it's almost like it's creating a list from 1 to 10 or from 10 to 1 or whatever you want. Uh, if you've read the slide, you know that technically it's not really creating a list. We can make it create a list, but it's what's called a generator. It's just giving you the next thing in the sequence every time you run through the loop. <coughs> but for those people who have a little experience with Java or C and you're used to creating a loop that goes from 1 to 10 and doing something 10 times, you can do that in Python. You just do it with the range function. We'll call it the range function because everybody else calls it that, but technically it's a generator. Okay. There's one last one I'm going to do for you. I'm going to say start at 0, go to 101, and you don't have to be limited by 1. You can do, we can do 5. Okay. My OCD is going to make me get rid of those spaces. I don't know why. And you can see we just did multiples of five going up the line. Okay. Remember, second one is, is the first thing you don't want. It's exclusive. It's a range in Python. All right. Again, and I know I say it all the time, do not worry. You're not going to have to type this code because I am going to put it up on the web for you. All right. <coughs> okay. Now, we've finally gotten there. We've gotten to the point where we have the tools in our tool or no, our workbench to solve real problems. So what I usually do at this point is I create a little phony problem and we take a look at solving it. Now, a little phony problem I always come up with is find out <coughs> what. Hmm. The find out what squares of the first we'll do five now nah, we'll do three hundred because I know the answers <laughs> of the first three hundred natural numbers are greater than fifty thousand. Okay, so of the squares of the first three hundred natural numbers. How many of them are greater than 50,000? Like most problems in computer programming, when we use computer programming to solve them, and it's like this with the Euler problem, we're going to see when we do the next video, it's usually a whole bunch of different problems all slammed into one. So the first thing I'm going to want to do, let's see, 4i in, I'll say range, I start at 1, and I go to 301, and I'm just going to print i for right now see what we get. I want to grab the first 300 natural numbers. So I grab from 1 to 300 and I'm in pretty good shape. Let's go make sure it started at 1 and it did so we're okay. All right. So I've got the 300 but what do I want? I really want the squares. So right there in the print I can actually square it. And now I get the squares. All right. I'm pretty sure that's a square because 300 squared is that but let's go back to the beginning and take a look. All right, those are the regular numbers, and those are the squares, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, okay? <coughs> so that's pretty good, but I'm a Python programmer. 
What do I want? I want the squares of the first 300. So what am I going to do? Watch this. I'm going to create a list. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, take my list and append the square of those numbers. Now I will print squares. So there they are in a list. You can see the bracket. You can see all the numbers all the way to the end. And you might be saying, well, that's, you know, just a different format. You printed it up here, but you also printed it down here. But now I have a list, okay? And what can I do because I have a list? I can iterate over it for i in squares. No more range. Don't need it. I have a list with the numbers that I need in there that have all the squares. But what am I looking for? I'm going to say if i is greater than 5,000, what do I want to do? In this instance, I'm just going to print i and take a look at things, okay? I run this. Okay, let's see what we got up here on the top. <clears throat> 5176 looks pretty good, okay? I come up here, I find 5176, and I see that the number before it was 49... 729, that's pretty good. That means I'm in good shape here. But I still haven't answered my question. What squares? Well, I'm looking at them, but I want to know how many of them there are. Okay? So I'm going to do something, a little trick, called create a counter. I'm going to create a variable called count. I'm going to set it equal to zero. And then what I'm going to do is here in this code block, when i is greater than then 50,000, I'm going to make count equal to count plus one. So think about it. It's like clicking a counter. Click, click, click. I add one every time it's true. So I can keep track of how many of them are. And then because I'm a schmoddy, I'm just going to print it out down there. So that as I print my numbers out, I'm going to print what number it is. Okay? Get a look at that. It's an important concept to wrap your head around. So now when I do it, that's the first one, that's the second one, that's the third one, all the way down until we get to the end, and I find out that there are 77 of them. And that's pretty much the answer. There's 77. In the first 300 natural numbers, if you square them, 77 of them are greater than 50K. All right? So that's the answer to our problem. But we're going to do one more thing, just because I want you to see it. That's a counter. I'm also going to create something called an accumulator. Now, counter is a clicker. It clicks off. An accumulator, what do we want an accumulator to do? Accumulate the values of all the things. But that means we don't want to add one. What do we want to add? In this case, we're dealing with numbers, so we want to deal with the number itself. So I'm going to add i to the accumulator. All right? And then I'll print it right there. All right? So now when we rerun, we get the total. So at the end, we see that 90,000, and we know we have 77 of the squares of the natural numbers from 1 to 300. There's 77 of them, and if we were to add them up, they are 5,300,000-something. Okay? So think about it. Little piece of code right here, but what are we doing? We're dealing with lists, we're dealing with for loops, and we're iterating. We're using methods to append to our lists, okay? We're using counters, we're using accumulators, we're doing some decision-making, all right, here we're loading up our list with the data we want to examine <coughs> the squares of the first 300 natural numbers. And then down here, we're using criteria to go through it, right, and find out the numbers we want. It's a data science-y kind of task, okay? We're only a couple weeks in, but now you, you're kind of getting the gist of what we're doing. We're examining a list of 300 things. And you'll see computers go so fast, it doesn't matter whether that's 300 or 3 million. You blast right through it. And you can see what's greater than, than in this case, 50K. And add things up, all right? So you've got some tools now, which is why all of a sudden Project Euler opens up to us. And we're going to do number six in the next video. But I just wanted you to see this. We're, we're in problem-solving land. Note how to do a counter. Note the accumulator. We do not go over it in the slides, and it is going to show up in a quiz, and or you're going to want to use it when you do your assignments, okay? 
So keep that in mind. This is where everyone I know who deals with this course with me and all of my friends and all of my colleagues in computer science tell me I should end the video because if I ever have a video that should be split in two, it should be this one. Because we're about halfway through and I'm going to show you three more topics and three more things. I could very easily just end the video here. <coughs> so if you want to take a break, take a break here. All right, click pause and just leave my big fat head on the screen like that and come back later because we're going to go over three more things. We're going to go over three more specialty or specialized kind of loops or loop features. We're going to look at nested loops. We're going to look at indefinite loops or while loops. And then we're going to look at something called a sentinel loop. All right. But this is a natural place to pause. <coughs> Maybe someday I'll split it into two. But right now I figure out ah, it's going to take us 10 minutes. Let's just mow through this stuff and get it done. And if you want to watch it another time, watch it another time. But I'm going to go through it and do it right now, okay? Nested loops are interesting because later you're going to learn that's how we nav navigate table data with rows and columns. But for our purposes, I'm just going to say 4i in range, and I'll say 3, and I will print outer, and then i. And we'll see what that looks like. So if I run that, you see it just goes outer 0, outer 1, outer 2. So I run three different things. So now, watch this. Instead of ending, I'll say for j, because I'm already using i. I'm in the loop that uses i. For j in range 5, I will print inner and j. Actually, I'll print i and j in the inner loop. So now when I run this, watch. Look at that. See? The outer loop runs, but inside my outer loop, I have another smaller loop that runs five times. And you can see inner, 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 inner. Um, it's in the zero loop, but it goes zero, one, two, three, four, and then it stops. Then when it stops, we go back to the very top. And I do the second iteration of outer. Outer one, but then I run the inner all over again. See? Until I'm done, then I go to the top and I run this all over again. That is called a nested loop. And if you think about it, it's how we navigate a list within a list. <clears throat> okay? It's also how we navigate table data. If you think of outer and inner as columns and rows okay think about the outer as a row so I'm going to the first row and then think about the inner as a column so row one one two three four five six seven done boom row two one two three four five six you see what I'm saying that nested loops is often how we navigate table data all right so it comes in handy and, and at the end of the day, looping, that's what it's about. It's about navigating through our data and going through our data. And you're going to see what in the past, in the old-fashioned C, Java days, these things were called multidimensional arrays. Now we just call it a list within a list. So you can have a list of lists. Well, what's a list of lists? It's a table, right, if you think about it. If one list is row one and the other list is row two and the other list is row three, you know, that's all it is. So... Nested loops is a way for us to navigate table data <coughs> and for us to go inside of more complex data types. All right? So I want you definitely to see that. Now, the second kind of neat loop feature we're going to look at is a indefinite loop. We have been doing car equals y. <coughs> We've been doing loops where we know exactly how many times they're going to run. If I iterate over a list with five items in it, I'm doing it five times. If I set up range 10, I know I'm going through that 10 times. What if I don't know how many times I'm going to go through the loop? And you might be saying, well, when would that happen? I'm going to do one right now. I'm going to say while care Uh, 
All right, look at that. Let's say print. And so we know when we're out of the loop. While is a keyword that creates a loop for us that's called an indefinite loop. While will keep you in the loop as long as the condition that it's looking at is true. So what I do is I create a variable called car. It's just short for character. And I make it equal to y. Okay? Then I say while car is up. Oh, that's a good thing I saw that because I need assignment there. I can't have equals. I mean, I need equals. I can't have assignment. One equal sign is assignment. Two is equality. So I say while car is equivalent to y, go in this loop. I'll print in the loop, but then I'll ask for a new character. Okay? So if it's y, if I give it a y, I'll come back up here and it'll be true again. So I'll print in the loop again and I'll ask for a new char. And I can keep doing that as long as I give it y. The minute I give it something different, let's say an n, I'll come up here. While car equal to y, it's not. It's n. So it'll drop us out and say end. Watch. All right. In the loop, new car, I'll say y. So as long as I give it a y, I'm good until I give it something that's not a lot y, and then I drop out, OK? Here's the point. I'm going to run it again. This one ran seven times. This one ran three times. Why? Because I'm changing what it's examining inside the loop. This is an example of two different kinds of loops. One, an indefinite loop. I'm not sure how many times I'm going to iterate because it depends on something that's being decided inside the loop. Okay? And it's also an example of a second kind of loop, which is called an interactive loop, which means the user's changing the input inside of the loop and it has to be examined every time around okay now I could if I wanted to I could not look at this because if we if we look at this and I say why 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 well what if I give it a Z that ends because I'm looking to make sure it's equal to Y so I can also say not equal to n all right so now when I run it I can say y, y, but now if I give it a z, it stays in there. And it'll stay in there no matter what I give it, unless I give it an n. And when I give it an n, that becomes untrue because car is equal to n, and then I will drop out. All right? So there's two different ways to do it. You could look for the negation or you could look for the positive. It doesn't matter. All right? So that is an indefinite loop. Every video game you've ever played in your life is wrapped in a while loop just like that okay and when you get to the end of the game and it says want to play again y or n that's exactly what it is trust me because i made them all right that every video game is sitting in a big while loop and if you say you want to play again it brings you right back to the top just like this does okay you're going to use it a lot you're going to know your programs that you've had to run over and over again with different data now you can just put them in a big while loop and at the very end of the loop, say, want to do it again? And if you say why, it goes to the top of the loop. So you don't have to end the program anymore. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're using while loops like that. Again, you don't have to code it up. I will put it up on the Sakai resources for you. But we have one, two, three. <coughs> one more thing left to do. And that, my, I'll do capital S, my second list. And I will make this list equal to something I can add up easily until I get to, yeah, 12 is good. Uh, 300, and then it won't matter. All right. We're going to look at the third kind of specialty list or specialty iteration looping situation we want to look at here. We're going to look at something called a sentinel loop. All right, we've been dealing with loops that basically examine the entirety of your list. If you give a for loop your list, you're going to go from the first item to the end of the item, and that's it. Okay, there's no stopping, there's no doing anything. What if you had a situation where you want to look for a particular value in the list, and when you find it, you want to stop? So the example I usually give 
here, if you look at my second list here, I just have a whole bunch of lists. I have a whole list of numbers. What if I wanted to add up all of the numbers before 300 and then print that out? Okay, I don't care what comes after 300. Frankly, I don't care about the 300 itself. I just want to see it. I want to know what all the numbers before 300 add up to. In this case, we got 2, 4, 6, 12, 20, 30, 42. It should add up to 42, right? So, what am I going to do? I guess I could say for i in my second list, all right? Be nice if I had in. And then what do I want to do? I want to add things up. So because I know how to do it now, I am going to use an accumulator. And I'm going to say cum equals cum plus i. And then when I get out, I'm going to print a cum. So when I do this, I get 478. Because I've added everything else, I haven't stopped. So what do I need to do? I guess I need to start looking at the numbers when I first come into the thing. So if i is equal to 300, what do I want to do? Well, I want to stop. But that's, I really don't want to do that. Maybe I want to do this. If i is not equal to 300, that makes things a little easier. Then I want to add to my accumulator which I'm doing right here. Okay, that I get. But here's my problem. What do I do when it is 300? Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the sentinel, which is the thing we're looking for. So what happens when I hit 300? When I hit 300, I, I want to be done because I just want to add up all the numbers before it. So I want to get out of that loop. Is there a way for me to do that? There is. It's the Python keyword break. And you can see it makes that orange. Now, you're not going to break out of an if-else structure. You're going to break out of the loops. Break breaks out of loops. So you're going to break out of that for loop. So when I hit that, you're going to go to, accumulate, for, accumulate, all the way down the line so you see 300. Then if i not equal to 300, well, that's not true, okay, because it is 300. So I'm going to go to the else and I'm going to break. I'm going to break out of this loop and a cum should be 42. Okay? And if the programming gods are with us, you get 42. All right? Now, a lot of old-fashioned programmers will complain about that. There's two programming constructs we used to use back in the dinosaur days. One was called goto, which was not very good. And then there's also break, which technically isn't very good either because you shouldn't just be smashing out of loops whenever you want to. You should have, you should logically be able to find a way to examine the whole list. But sometimes lists get long. And processing wise, I don't want to examine the whole list. I could have set up something here that said, if I see 300, set a flag to Y instead of N. And every time the flag is Y, don't add it to the accumulator. So then I could examine the whole list and I'll still get 42. Because after the 300, I'm not adding them anymore. All right, I could logically as a computer programmer create that structure, but then I would have to examine the whole list. What if the list is 40 million items long and the Sentinel resides in space 200? I really want to loop through 42 million things when I've already got my answer? You don't really have to. So if you're smart and you have, it's like anything else, if you have a dangerous tool, a blowtorch, a chainsaw, it doesn't mean you don't use it. It's just that you're careful when you use it, okay? Break is one of those things that I want you to be careful when you use it. That's all I want to say, all right? All right, good enough. Now, this is cool. We have an honest to goodness, good looking finale today. Because there is a lot of code here. Let's run it. Look at this. All right, new car. Y, 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 Z, Z. It's taking anything except N. And then it says end 42. 42, it's like Hitchhiker's Guide. If you guys understand that, you are nerdy like me. All right. Um, that's it. That's the loop video. Uh, go back and check it out. <coughs> Read your slides. Um, now's that point. Boom, boom. And I think I even say it in the slides. Now's the point. You have simple data. 
you have simple decision making, you have data types and you understand booleans and you understand integers and floats and strings and things like that. You know how to use strings, you know how to use lists, and now you can iterate over them, now you can loops. Now you have the tools in your brain to start solving problems and we're going to start doing that next when we look at some of the project Euler stuff. Now you have enough, you've still got more, we're still going to learn about functions and compartmentalizing our logic, we're still going to learn about file I.O. We're still going to learn about all the libraries that are out there for us to use and some different math and some different things along those ways when we get to unit three. And we're going to learn more things about object orientation and blah, blah, blah. But right now, as you can see, when you're looking at this code right here, all right, it's still September. You only started this class three weeks ago. Look at some of this code we're doing, all right? You wouldn't have thought you'd be doing this by three weeks into the course. So examine this code. Absorb it, get into it, all right? All right, good. Then I'm going to do some announcements because the next video I do is probably going to be over the weekend and it'll probably have to do with Project Euler, but that's kind of a special add-on Easter egg -y kind of video thing. It's not part of your core resources that you need for the unit. Right now, this video is probably the last of the core resources you're going to need to do your assignments, and I'll start releasing the assignments in the next few days. You'll have more than a week with all of your resources to do the assignments uh, this unit. Uh, I don't know, when does the unit end? October 5th? I'll definitely have them to you in the next couple of days. Um, you have the slides. You have your Zell readings. You have two review videos steep in it. Get going with it. When you see the assignments, you'll they're not super long, but you need to think. Okay, I'll just throw that out there. And then over the weekend, I'll get you the Euler. I want you to do the assignments and be, be squared away before you start playing with the Project Euler stuff. All right? But the Project Euler stuff is neat, and I'll tell you that whole story when we get to that video. Um, in the next, also in the next few days, because now is when I would do it, uh, you know what? We're going to meet soon, so maybe I hold off. And I tell you about that when we meet. Nah, two things. One, I'm going to release the information sheet for the midterm. So you can start preparing to do your midterm assignment. Your midterm assignment is basically going to be regard three different online tools for learning Python. All right. The Harvard 50 videos. I used to go to MIT OpenCourseWare, but this is time I'm going to do the Harvard 50s. Um, learn Python the hard way and Code Academy. For about two hours in each instance, you're going to go through these processes. And then I want you to write a compare and contrast paper. Only five pages, uh, double spaced. So it's two and a half pages. And then the magic of double spacing instantly gives you a five page paper. All right. Don't bitch and moan because you didn't expect to get a paper in a CS class. This is grad school. Buck up. Uh, and I'm also going to start giving you some information about forming groups. We have a, a fairly, as far as this course is concerned, a fairly large class. We have close to 60 students. So what I'm going to ask is that we put together groups of four or five of you to do your final projects, because your final project is a group project. And I'm thinking four or five, maybe five is the right number for groups in this class. And I'm going to get you together as early as I can, I'm going to get you your own forum on the Sakai site, and then not only will you be a group for the final project, you can also be a study group together. And after class, when I get done with class, you can remain behind and talk with each other and share ideas and share code and do all that stuff. So in the back of your mind, think about group formation. Think about four other people that you might want to be in a group with or you might want to work with. Maybe somebody from your other classes, somebody you know, a friend. If and I know it's difficult because it's a hybrid. We don't see each other a lot. We've had one class. And, we're, you know, after next week, we're only going to have two classes. You, you can't really get to know anybody. It's not a chance. So don't worry about it. At the end of the day, if you don't get in a group, I'm going to assign you and put you in a group. And for whatever reason in the past, that's always worked out. I don't know why. But you'll see when we, do the, when we get to the final project uh, information stuff, which is still a while off, so don't let it freak you out. But when we get there... Um, you'll see that there are different roles and there are different things for people to do. And we, for whatever reason, when we set up groups, we usually get lucky. All right. All right. So things are moving along. Work with the resources. 
Rewatch the videos. Make sure you're comfortable with everything. Hans has got people handing in programs that were like written in Microsoft Word. That's bananas. All right? If that's the case, you've got to go back and watch the early videos. All right? Use idle. Create .py files like we're doing here with idle. All right? Plain text files with a .py suffix. That's what we need. If we can't run it, we can't grade it. If we can't grade it, you get a zero. Okay? So get that squared away now, Pro the, the program creation stuff. I, I think most of you are fine with it, so don't let that freak you out either. All right? All right. Then I leave you with one last thing. <clears throat> Be extremely careful. Driving down your street, going to work, going to school, whatever, for skunks. Because they... they run in packs and they they're uh, they're I'm right now unable to distinguish between them and terrorist organizations okay it's a it's a growing problem and so I, I sometimes I don't even feel like I can leave my house <coughs> and I don't want that for you I want you I want you to have a better life than I had <laughs> all right all right then I'm gonna get out of here you be good and uh, believe me, the Project Euler video is coming this weekend, and we're going to have some fun with all of that stuff. Because then you can take all of your programming knowledge and start using it, all right? I don't want to start talking again. I'm trying to end the video. So I will see you later. Bye.